Well, welcome back, everybody, to Between Two Sermons. So great to have you back with us again, John Amaya and Rob, Rob Catalani. Good to be here. Here we are. Good to be here. Yep, back in the saddle again. John's got his flower shirt on. I do. Very nice, it, very it, sharp, very it's, spring. It's spring, but not to spring. Right. It's a little subdued. They're yeah, subdued okay. flowers. It's gray spring or yeah. you know, dark green That's, spring. That yeah. could be like emo flowers yeah, or no, something. I'm good. not sure. It so, good. Anyway, so, uh, but besides my shirt, we're here to talk today about Ephesians 1, yes. 3 through 14. Yeah. Just so happens to be one of my favorite passages in the New nice. Testament. I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, it's densely packed with Definitely. theological just richness right. in Absolutely. this one passage. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I've done some because, you know, Ephesians is one of those popular books that you yeah, kind of do studies right. on mm-hmm. and seminary work on and stuff right. like that. The passage that you're talking about this week is actually one sentence in Greek. I know. Isn't that something? Yeah. That's so amazing. It's like Paul gets so excited about yeah. what he's talking about that yeah. he just rambles on yeah. and on and yeah. on and on. And you know what makes me think about that, um, diving right in, yeah. I mentioned in the sermon that, you know, in a way, I, 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 I've i never heard anyone say this, so I was kind of having fun, but um, that Ephesians is like the genesis of the mm. New Testament. And I said, you know, it's new creation and all mm-hmm. these great ideas, theological ideas, as you say, that are in the opening. But... It's interesting that, um, you know, as I was thinking about it, only because I'm doing this series, that Genesis chapter 1, where we started a month ago or so, is, you know, you would say, I mean, I believe, I think you believe, we believe that this is God's word and Mm -hmm. it's speaking about, in some sense, the history origin of the world, but it's a poem Mm -hmm. of a kind. I mean, Mm -hmm. obviously, there's so much it doesn't say, and the writer is telling you something, uh, Mm -hmm. in this case Moses, is telling us something or telling uh, the people of God in the Old Testament something and then us, but he's doing it in an artistic form, like a psalm, like a a proverb, etc. And this has that feeling. It does. So it is... Whether it's a you know a lot most people would say it's 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 doxology you know it's mm-hmm. it's a form of praise kind of almost like a a song or a hymn uh, 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 of a kind so it really is quite amazing that you mm-hmm. you you yes of course there's w- deep theology there rich theology there but it's you have to kind of just experience it as a as a piece of art almost first yeah that's a good that's a good way to put it it's like a piece of art yeah and just like a piece of art you're trying to pick it apart but each person is going to kind of receive a little something different absolutely but i did like the way that you you pointed out three foundational pieces of this piece of art if we talk about it that way um first of all the fact that for those of us who've placed our faith in christ we are chosen. Yeah. So big. Yeah. I mean, that just, that statement in and yeah. of itself is yeah. such a powerful statement. Yeah. A lot of us know what it's like to not feel chosen. Right. And yet the God of the universe yeah. has chosen us. Yeah. I know. That's so interesting. You yeah. say that people feel what it's like to not feel chosen. And, and some of us know in, in, you know, smaller or big ways what it feels like to be chosen in a good way, you know, mm-hmm. uh, your husband, wife, the the prom, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, a new job, whatever it is, um, you know, maybe, you know, we hit, we probably have both, mm-hmm. but it is such a powerful concept. Yeah. And in this case, y- you know, almost everything we hear in the Bible is a kind of metaphor of a kind, you know, children of God and, and brothers and sisters, you know, is used to church members right mm-hmm. these are these are concepts even jesus as the son of god in a mm-hmm. sense is an image that mitch is trying to communicate something to us because mm-hmm. he's not the son in the same way that right. you and i are sons of our mm-hmm. parents but um this idea of chosen is clearly used by this writer uh, the apostle paul in this passage four times or he uses chosen and predestined they're sort of similar ideas and it's like wow if mm-hmm. you you know, it's not like he's sneaking in this right. word because he has to. He's clearly trying to make a point. Mm-hmm. And uh, you didn't even bring this up, thank you. But <laughs> the uh, the it's a it's it's a theologically um, complex uh, concept, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes called election, and people get um, you know confused by it or annoyed by it. But uh, it's also, if we can put that aside for a moment, the concept 
that God chose me mm. or chose one is so powerful. Right. And I think that's um, must be what the writer's trying to say. I, my sense is that Paul, whether or not this was controversial in his day, I don't know. I mean, this, this mm-hmm. theological um, topic. But I think he felt strong enough to say the, the weight of this truth, the value of this truth is so important that I'm going to really lead with it mm-hmm. because it's true, I guess. It, it, in one sense, he's saying it's true, but it also must be meaningful to us. Right. There's a there's a weird irony, isn't there, in this passage in that it's supposed to be so comforting, and yet I think in some ways, it, for those of us who've been around the church scene for a little while, this passage kind of like you're yeah, alluding to yeah. has this divisiveness to yeah, it like yeah. which side are you on this That's side right. or that side and we can get hung up on that as right. compared to the intent of yes. what paul has for right, us right, right which is oh my goodness yeah the god who created everything chose you to be his child i know no, like right. imagine that yeah and um, there's even a passage again or are words in there you 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 don't know exactly what it means or what it's what the real intent is when he says god before the foundation of the world mm-hmm. um yeah. predestined you to be adopted as his child etc right. and you're thinking wow that's a weighty thing to say mm-hmm. and why even say that but one would assume it's trying to say um i want to put beyond all doubt mm. that not only before you were born mm-hmm. or before you did a bad thing or a good thing or a lot of stupid things that we that we do in our lives and we begin to see ourselves through the lens of our own imperfect uh, behaviors. Mm-hmm. You know, why would God want me or love me? And Paul's saying, let me just put this to rest mm-hmm. before there ever was a you, mm-hmm. anyone that even was p- walking the earth, mm-hmm. you know, kind of an overstatement. God already made a decision about you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that leads so so beautifully into your second point, yeah. which, you know, you are loved. Yeah. And for some of us, we can we can grasp that. We get it. OK, yeah, God loves me, whatever. We kind of brush that off. But I think to really let that sink into yeah. our souls yeah. is another matter. Yeah, it, I think it is. Uh, it may be. Um, I think someone once asked. Uh, Rick Warren, if those of you know him, you know, what's the purpose of life? And, and you know, he's such a easy talker guy and very smart. And mm. But he took a beat mm. and he said, you could tell he was thinking about it. It was like a talk show or something. And he said, the purpose of life is um, for us to um, receive God's love. Mm. And you could tell he said, like, in other words, this isn't easy. Right. And... Um, and I thought that was really interesting. Out of all the things he could have said, and 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 you, most things that are the purpose of anything are are, are a big deal. Like the yeah. purpose of life is to climb a mountain or mm-hmm. or to have a family or something. And and what would seem like you'd think an easy thing, receive God's love. Mm-hmm. Um, he was sort of saying that's not so easy. Mm-hmm. And we all know why that is because of our own sin and our own brokenness and our own bad. Um, experiences with people that we yeah. project onto God, all the things that we know. And I think it's so important though. You you could even say, he does say in love uh, mm-hmm. and there in grace is used. There's clearly an implication or a, a teaching about the importance of God's love. But you might say, well, Rob, are you not saying the same thing twice? You are mm. chosen, you are loved. And I'm going to say kind of yes and no. Mm. They, they're they're over. They overlap, yeah. but they might say they're not exactly the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but they're, they 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 reinforce each other, and maybe the, to 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 make the point that not only are you chosen, mm-hmm. but you are chosen because of a great love, mm-hmm. and and maybe we need that because you think why spend so much time on this sort of cascade of ideas and layering them and in, in in sort of overwhelming us with this uh, this concept of God. I think he might have used the word lavish in mm-hmm. that passage. You know, you would guess he did that because he senses that's what we need. Yeah. And perhaps that it's so foundational. Some have said, maybe this is true in other books of the Bible, that Ephesians, which we're not studying in, in detail in this series, but that um, the first three chapters are all about really 
core truths. They're not mm-hmm. really talking about how to live and mm-hmm. do this and don't do that and be mm-hmm. a good husband and be a good this. That's four, five, and six. But mm-hmm. the, they spends three chapters. And we're just a, one, just saying, let me di- tell you what is true about you because you are a son or daughter mm-hmm. of God, because you're a child of God. And it's very important, yeah. one would think, to say, um, assume that unless we can grasp these truths, mm-hmm. learn how to internalize them, then we're not going to be able to live a particular kind of life. And, and, and that also is what brought me to Ephesians, because this is about identity. We're trying to say, how do I, you know, I can tell you a thousand things. I could put a a, a badge and a something on you and say, you know, you're a tomorrow you're going to be a police officer or whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of ways in which we can we can have different roles and adopt a, a new identity. You mm-hmm. know, that's not always a bad thing. You know, I'm going to, there's a thousand ways we'd say, you know, I, I put my work hat on or whatever. But to be a follower of Jesus, according to the Bible, really is a an identity um, forming, identity fostering kind of experience like nothing else and that's that's why we're here in this passage yeah and the it just reminds me of of uh something that i heard a, a professor of theology say that someone asked him what is the most important theological message that that you've tried to incorporate into your life and he took a pause kind of like the rick warren yeah. and, and and said hmm Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Yeah, like just that—the yeah. simplicity of that yeah. is—it yeah. takes a lifetime for us to really yeah. apply it yeah. to our lives. Yeah, no, that it, and it made me think of too uh, another passage, parallel passage that I uh, referenced. You know, uh, on this concept of being chosen, mm-hmm. and he uses the word in First Corinthians. You know, uh, but but clearly the writer in this case again the Apostle Paul is is trying to. It, you, you're supposed to see it's dripping with irony. Mm-hmm. You know, um, uh, you know, for uh, you, you, this is a paraphrase, but God didn't. Um, you're not the most intelligent. You're not the most wise. You're not of royal birth. Mm-hmm. He, I mean, if you first read that, you think he's almost being critical. Right. But Paul's trying to make a point. When listen, think about who you are, brothers and sisters. Think about saying this to the church in Corinth. Um, you know, you, many of you perhaps were, um, not from the upper class, you know, yeah. whoever you want to say it, but God yeah. chose you. God chose the foolish things of the world, the, 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 um, the things that are not mm-hmm. God chose the, you know, the unspectacular. I mean, you have to read that passage, mm-hmm. but he says three times God chose you so that. Yeah. You, in a way, you'd know mm-hmm. it's about His love, right? And and therefore, I think it ends with you know, don't boast. You know, you, there's no reason to boast. Yeah. And 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 I like that too because in both these passages, back to identity, in one sense, if you if you sat down with me and said, I'm going to tell you, a, I'm going to give you an hour full of what a great person you are, mm. I could get a big head. Yeah. I could walk away, and it's very unhelpful. But the the idea here is God's love and God's grace. It's a it's the kind of love that you know is not earned. Mm. That's the whole idea of you were chosen before the foundation of the world. It's really not about you. It's about what comes from the heart of God. Um, you know, love. I read this somewhere. Love has its own rationale. It's a fancy mm. way of saying it doesn't really. It resides with the person giving it, mm. and that's very unusual and almost unheard of in human relationships. But in God, it's 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 the way He is, and when that, when we get a better sense of that, when that captures our imagination, our hearts in a deeper way, it's hopefully this is the idea, um, can really change us, can mm-hmm. really settle us, can really um, root our identity in something that's so deeply powerful and informing that it can really um, help us know how to make our way in the world. Yeah, and that's what your your final point was yeah. really that yeah. that our identity is formed. Yes. Right. Yeah. In Jesus. That's right. He is that 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 idea of formation. Yeah. Because you could have chosen another word that's there, right? right? Yeah, you, yeah. I think you used formed in yeah, that no, in I, that I, sense. I, I, I did because I, I I you know writing this up, I I used a word that we all think of intuitively, or at least those of us who've been thinking about you know been Christians for any length of time we see my identity is found in jesus mm-hmm. it's found there and that is true you know but 
but I liked the idea formed as I was mm-hmm. thinking uh, it out because, you know, you might say, well, how come Rob and John and whoever are both been Christians for, you know, 30 years or whatever, and, and they have a different level of um, joy or a different level of um, confidence or a different level of, you know, spiritual power, whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, um, you know, in other words, isn't it just about days on the calendar? And mm-hmm. of course, the answer is no. God's love, I don't believe, is any different for you or me or another person in its quality and its, let's say, mm-hmm. its 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 intent and in its in its presence, its reality. He lo- he doesn't love us because of what we've done, good or bad. Anyway, his love mm-hmm. is consistent and it's present. But our ability mm-hmm. to be formed by that love, our ability to be shaped by that mm-hmm. love, our ability to be um, influenced by that love and and these other God divine um, um, ideas and thing that's that's a different story. Yeah. So um, you know our mission statement, which is not you know unique to us in the sense of the idea, you, but we want to invite people into a life changing relationship with Jesus. But I, those words were chosen life changing to imply. Excuse me. It's an ongoing thing, mm-hmm. you know. Um, the Christian life is is a is a work in progress, not a work that you you're getting, but you're earning God's love, but that you're helping to um, work God's love into your life in deeper mm-hmm. and deeper ways. And and then there's a number of just a handful. There's so many in that passage, but he talks about some key mm-hmm. spiritual blessings, or let's yep. say resources that quote in Christ are available to people. Just just taking a couple, you know, uh, the forgiveness of sins. Mm-hmm. Now we often think of the forgiveness of sins as you know a transaction. In some ways, it is. I ask God to forgive me, and He does in Jesus. Um, And let's say he wiped the chalkboard clean Mm -hmm. that, you know, my sin has been wiped away and now I'm a Christian. There's a sense in which that's very true. But then experientially in the course of my life, because I'm a sinner, I still Mm -hmm. need um, real time forgiveness. I need to come back to um, find grace and help in time of need, as the writer of Hebrews says, every day do i Mm -hmm. see that where do i get that there's only one place to get that that i understand it's in jesus and so um our identities um in one sense you know you could say it depends on what what lens you're looking through i'm a man i'm a woman i'm a i'm a i'm an american i mean some of these things are are sort of you know straightforward and they're they don't change maybe yeah but when it comes to our identity in christ no this this is as far as how i really live it out and experience it, 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 it is a changing thing. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm becoming more um, firm, confident, true of my identity as I'm formed by these great realities. Mm. Yeah. And I love the fact that that's where you landed us in, in your sermon. Yeah. You brought us to looking at some of those things yeah. that are the blessings of the passage that's right. and, and really allowing those to settle into our lives. And yeah. for each of us, we might need one of those things to, right. to experience one piece of that right. in a unique way, yeah. um, just based off of where we're at in this season yeah. of our life. That's so, right. I mean, I think that's a great place for all of us to really just stop and and yeah. pause you know if you're if you're watching this by yourself maybe open up Ephesians 1 3 mm. through 14 or even in the context of your small group do the same thing open it up and just read through that passage together and then as a result of that pick out what phrase yeah for those of us who are following Jesus with our right. lives that this is true of right. us right Pick out what phrase stands out the most to you, and what is the most meaningful to you at this yeah, season and, of your or, life. And or where, what do you need the most? Mm. I mean, if mm-hmm. if you could look at these as um, big um, truths that we intersect, you know, redemption, um, forgiveness, adoption, the fact that I'm chosen. Those are just mm-hmm. a few. And if these are all ways in which the gospels work in Jesus is described. They're all, you know, you might say they're all images. They're, mm. they're the, you know, we're trying to translate incredibly um, rich and, and you know, both theological and divine truths into human um, understanding. So they all have analogies, mm-hmm. right? There's a re- analogy for redemption. There's yep. an analogy for forgiveness. There's an analogy for chosen. Yes. We, 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 but it, as you think about your life, even right in this moment, where, where do I really need to 
um, lean in? Do, yeah. do I would 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 believing that God chose me? Just spending some time taking a yeah. walk, and and would would that did, would that mean something to me? Mm-hmm. Is that would that would that shore up a, a, mm-hmm. a weakness in my thinking, or that that He redeemed me, which means He, in a manner of speaking, He He bought me back, yeah. He rescued me, He paid a price, and and brought me um, back into His care, and re- rescued me from from being um, in a in a bad place, mm-hmm. you know, or He. You know, he forgave me. You know, I don't know anyone that doesn't need um, forgiveness. How many people, Christian people like you and me, now I'm not talking about non-Christians, them too. How many Christian people um, are living with levels of unforgiveness or not being able to, are living with levels of guilt mm-hmm. um, where God has, you know, I mean, some of us have always been in these, these places with friends, maybe spouses, and you say, honey, you're still, I mm-hmm. that's, I haven't thought about that in years. I've forgiven you Mm. or -hmm. they've forgiven you, Mm. but you haven't experienced that. Mm. So that's another way of leaning into and saying, Christ Jesus, this is what I need. Yeah. Um, So that's a, that's a good challenge. Yeah. Love that. Love that. Well, thanks again, Rob, uh, for leading us in this passage in this whole series and uh, hope for it is as meaningful to you as it is to me to have this kind of conversation together. So, Have a great week, and we'll see you hopefully back here next week at Between Two Sermons.